partner with my book, so I'm real happy with that. And uh, and, the, and where I am is not a good spot. It's a rough dock on the river, and the tides and the wind changed, and we busted our bumper boards, and the poles were rubbing against the boat. So I was up in the middle of the night trying to fix the tires. So I'm just trying to get adjusted. I finally have had enough chance to rest. I'm feeling rested. I'm really lucky I didn't get sick and feel bad. And I've recuperated enough right now. And I'm, I still have a little bit of disorientation. When I get ready to come into town, I'm going, do I have Harold's address? Well, I know where he lives, but I better write it down. And then I can't remember where I put the piece of paper where I wrote it down. And I say, well, do I have my bicycle key? Which pocket is it in? And so I'm having a little trouble adjusting. Read, you are gorgeous. Just boring. You have a great future. Great. <laughs> what, from a sailor's survival, was the worst storm that you were in, and where was it? Okay, uh, I was turned over uh, just past Cape Horn and turned upside down. Turned turtle completely. Turned turtle completely. A roadway caught the boat and turned her upside down. Now you realize the boat is supposed to be able to do that. The boat's like a steel bottle with the keel 10 feet under the water, and I put 42,000 pounds of lead in the bottom of it. And so I knew that it was going to come up again with 1,200 gallons of water on top of that and all my cargo. And very short, thick wooden mass, and rigging cable is this thick. So I knew that the, the boat might do that, and I knew that she could do that. Um, uh, when the boats race, 80% of the boats drop out of a race because they're built light. It's a different thing. I'm more heavy. And I knew that I could do it. When it happened, I wasn't afraid. I was actually cooking at the time. And I could have held on better, but, but I, I had wires and stuff to hold the pots on the stove. But I was cooking and tried to tend to that. At first, I didn't realize what was going to happen. I ended up getting thrown uh, backwards in the galley. But it's all tight. When I designed the boat, I designed it for the worst storms possible. I always thought, how's it going to be in the worst storm? I didn't build a boat. Uh, for, for tourists or an old person to get around in. I, I always thought about what's it going to be like for me in the worst storm. So the quarters are tight. So I didn't get tossed too far. I went against the wall. But the hatch slide for the galley is a three-quarter inch plexiglass slide. It goes in the slide and then the hatch locks down on locks. It's not airtight. So when the boat went underwater, water squirted in. So I got knocked over and water squirted all over me. And I just remembered that everything turned white. I didn't black out. Everything turned white. I slammed it against the wall pretty hard. The boat came back up again. And in and, and one movement, I went to the stove and I cut it off because the cooking flames got down. Then I looked out of the window in the galley forward and I saw that the one sail that I had up was uh, blowing like ribbons. Nothing was left of it. It all just, the wind was so strong, it, the sail burst and blew away like ribbons. And I heard a bang against the side of the boat, and one of my solar panels had gotten knocked loose and was partially hanging by its mounting system and banging the side of the boat. I knew I had to get that right away. So I was completely wet, but I went right away into the uh, forward, into the pilot house. I looked into the building and saw I didn't have water. I pulled on my super warm suit real quick, and I went outside, harnessed on very well. And I've been outside in all kinds of rough weather, and I balance really well. And mostly I didn't wear my safety harness because I have lifelines around the boat that are this high. And because there's an array of ropes like you wouldn't believe that I had to tend to when I do the boat. And I need my freedom to move. So I rarely harness on unless I'm actually working on the ends or the, over the edge of the boat. But this time I had my safety harness on very close because I was afraid if that happened again, I'd be back into the ocean. I got this, the, uh, the solar panel back on. I got the, uh, the sail down. And I got my storm jib back on. I got the boat back on course. That took me a few hours. I came in. I'd been wet and salty all that time. It was very cold. So I undressed. I boiled a little water on the stove. And I mixed it with some cool water until it was as hot as I could take it. And I poured it over me. I rinsed. I took a hot bath. I got dressed and uh, and then I I made my dinner. I missed my yoga session. <laughs> <laughs> I made my dinner and uh, and lashed myself into bed. I had this system of kind of canvas sleep cloths, and then I put up this big net in case that happens. I don't get rolled out of bed. And my boat was going on course after that, and 
I let her go on course and say, well, you know, I can't, I'm not going to look for a shift for the next few hours. I'm just going to have to go to sleep. I'm going to sleep. As always, I woke up a few hours later and looked all around and never saw a shift. And that was the roughest storm and the biggest you know, turnover. You're alone and probably pretty lonely, but it's kind of a silly question. Were there any animals along the way that... I have beautiful pictures of every kind of sea life that you can imagine. And I've had uh, communications with all kinds of whales and fish and birds and photos of whale sharks, big ones, right next to the boat, hanging out with me all day in crystal clear water. And I have great wildlife stories and pictures so they follow from the voyage. They would follow me and hang with me, or a sperm whale would lay next to the boat and look almost as big as the boat. His tail fin itself was 25 feet wide. He was literally as big as the boat, and he laid upside down and was jaw and hung around. I've had, I had a group of whales with their noses up to the boat one calm morning and I woke up because I heard them singing. And I said, that sounds like whales singing. I went outside and there they were singing to me. Oh, I've had all kinds of <laughs> fish and whale and bird stories, nature stories. <laughs> That's going to be so cool. <laughs> Did you record them? I didn't record the whales. Have you thought at all about telling uh, Well, I, I'm, I'm not much of a, a media person, and I don't know much about what it's Speak for yourself, John Owen. You're fantastic. No, I'm, just a, I'm, a, I'm an explorer and a mystic, and I've found grace and power from loving God. If I can share that in any way possible, I'm going to do it. I have to aim. Uh, I'm going to aim as high as I can. Culturally, I, I hope that, um, that, that I can uh, interest and inspire people on a world level as much as possible. Right. The world's going multimedia, brother. Right. Wait, you've documented a lot of this. I have all, uh, lots of films, lots of photos, and, and incredible paintings that tell right. stories of the modern day world. So, could you tell us something about your life out there as a mystic? My life out there as a mystic. I've been talking about it all night long. <laughs> I started by talking about it. I've been talking about it all night long. I guess you walked yeah, in sorry, the way. Sorry, but you'll find it on my website, a thousand days.net. There's a lot of stuff there that delves into all of that and what it what it means, <clears throat> how I do it. And that's really important. It's not just a wishy-washy thing. I describe exactly step by step procedures, how you can accomplish those states and maintain them what you can do by being in that area. Your past instruction of time, do you see you can create and process in nature as well? You're saying, I see the creative process it in nature? Whether you see the creative process in nature as well. The creative process of nature as God, he says. Yes, I do. The, the creative process of nature is the play of God, the dance of God, the joy of God. And you were asking a question. Did, did you do the yoga at a specific time every day? I was in the session. extremely, extremely exact in my routine. I was so exact in my routine, it was incredible. Almost every time of, uh, throughout the day, at the exact time, there was a moment when I looked for ships, was a moment when I made my coffee, was a moment when I wrote, was, was, was the time that I went to my toolbox, was the time that I got up, was the time that I sent my email. My routine became incredibly exact. I could move around the boat blindly and put my hand on a thousand things that I need. I've been a little disorganized since I got back. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Reed is an enlightened master man of the sea. Wonderful journey that you challenged death and you found God. Talk to us, please, of what you feel or think about this terrible Gulf War, not Gulf War, the um, oil. Mexican Gulf oil gushing problem. Yeah, like that's like the Gulf War. Yeah. The Gulf War. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a uh, right thing. Well, uh, gushing uh, Gulf, gush, gushing Gulf, Gulf War. Yes. It's all the same thing. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm sure people here have a lot more to say about uh, um, how uh, corruption has taken over the world for so many years and how science has enabled man to have greater and greater disasters and 
that would be the, like the humanistic, the main humanistic question that man has been talking about for the last 200 years is what really is the good of science and what has it done for humanity and really to help humanity and have humanity have Right, now Copenhagen is on the table. Cure the protocol. The reality stuff. of alternative energy is necessary. You're yeah. a great example of alternative energy and working with nature. That's our solution. Well, Oil is over. War is I, over. I want to be an example of that. I've lived off the grid for over four years, um, uh, uh, only using solar power, and I uh, uh, caught my own rain for, for, for over four years. I haven't... Yes, I want to be a good example for that. I'm not a, uh, a, an expert at trying to solve the political problems of the world and how they affect the ecology. So I, I'm going to stick to uh, the message of my story and the uniqueness of it. I think that if there's a, a spiritual realization within people on a large whole and they realize in their hearts the importance of this, then uh, that will cause people to realize the importance of the environment and work more to get these things done. So I'm hoping that by a spiritual realization of people uh, that we will uh, realize the importance of our spirit going forward in the future and how we have to take care of this. Right. after solitude for so long you're able to just come back and talk. And, well, and, and it seems to me that there must have been something about the way you were living your life out there that made that possible. Okay, the way, what made it possible with the way that I lived my life out there. First of all, I've been doing this all my life, coming and going, back and forth. And I feel I have a message to share. But, but I, I wrote during this voyage almost every day. That's why I can access my articulation and I have a lot of things to say. When I was out there, I, did, I, wasn't, uh, I didn't speak for almost three years, but I wrote almost every day and I was digging real deep with what I was writing and that was meaningful with, for me. That's why I can talk right now. I have a lot to say so about the things that I did. you do that at night, the writing? I wrote only, almost exclusively only, during the times that I ate. When I sat down with breakfast, my notebook was there. Lunch, my notebook was there. Coffee break with snacks, my lunch, my notebook was there. Dinner, my notebook was there. During other times, I was too busy. I didn't read that much, but I created, uh, I, I love painting. I created a lot of art, so part of my afternoon was painting. And, and, I, and those were the times when I wrote. What did you read? Well, I read the Tao and, the, and Tibetan yoga and secret doctrines and uh, uh, most of the old religious books I read. And I read some interpretations of the religious books. And I read some Christian saints. And I read uh, uh, the, the Zen. So I was reading mostly spiritual things. How did you sublimate your urges during that time? Give into them, or did you use your spirituality to overcome them? What urges? Are you sexual urges? Or I learned how to, to transmute my sexual urges when I was 20 years old. When I sailed away on my catamaran, I left a beautiful girl behind who I was madly in love with, and I turned my vision to the goddess in the form of a beautiful woman. And every single time I had a sexual urge, I contracted. My, my lower muscles and I lifted the energy up and I gave my love to the goddess and uh, maybe you people can understand this sort of thing I haven't even ejaculated in over 25 years I have not ejaculated and people know about that that's in, in many cultures it's the transmutation of your lower physical energy into spiritual energy so by the time I went to see you this time uh, that was a total natural thing for me always transmuting my lower energy and lifting. So I was never lonely. There was never anything that I wanted. Because uh, if there's something that you want in your life and it's something good, and material things, they pass, they're not worth it, you know. The good thing that you really want is, is a vision of, of yourself as God seeing everything and being eternal. 
And when I saw God as everything and I was eternal, I wasn't about to look back and say there was something that I missed. But, but or, I, I missed or, that. How did you have a baby then? I was about to say. Okay, I'll tell you how. I'll tell you how. Because uh, men have what, what, I, what I see as a cum pot. And when you make love real strong, it boils. And most guys say, I gotta let it out. I can't keep it back. It hurts. But you learn how to keep it in. But it's like a little pressure cooker. And on top, when uh, uh, the, the steam cap rattles a little bit and a little bit of steam goes out. So I think some sperm was in that steam. <laughs> <laughs> I have a uh, okay, yes. <laughs> comment. Uh, when you were worried about uh, the Buddha God and all that Buddha never said he was a god. Uh, Buddha, Lord Buddha never said he was a god. I said he was a god. Never he said never, he said, he he never said he was a god. Well, my, there sec was god. my second question is, uh, I'm curious, how would you spend a day, let me see, a typical day? Okay, a typical day, again, I've been talking about it. And I said, this is when I wrote, this is the exact thing that, that I did. So a typical day was always uh, um, w wake up, go to the stove, turn on my coffee and my oats, which have already had a pre-boil the night before, so they're timed to be ready as soon as my coffee is. Then go to the bathroom, then go to the GPS, then go to the batteries, check my batteries, switch the batteries, go back, the coffee and the oats are ready, bring them back, sit down, um, uh, bring out my books, do my writing as soon as my uh, breakfast is through, clean up my breakfast, rinse my sprouts, and begin my work. And I worked. That was when I worked. Every morning I woke up and I did whatever had to be done, and I always knew what I wanted to do. Sometimes I didn't know. I'd go out on deck and I'd scan everywhere, and I'd see something and I'd do something. But every day I woke up and got to work. I gave the boat a lot of love. I was tuned into the boat, and I took care of her. Then lunch came and I made uh, lunch, and I had my big sprout salad, and I, and I wrote during lunch. And then after lunch, if there was work that I had to do, like for the first year, I worked all day solid throughout the whole day. I didn't have much time to write, and didn't do other stuff. But once things lightened up, after lunch, if I had a longer essay that I was working on, which I did towards the end of the year, I did that. And, and then I did my uh, uh, paintings, or worked on my doing uh, films and, and videos. And then I had my afternoon coffee every day at 4 o'clock with snacks, and I wrote. And when I finished that, then it was my really favorite time because I liked to paint. I had my paint box next to me, and I had my portfolio of papers and canvases stashed. And, and I'd pull out, and I'd paint till it got close to sunset. And then when it got to be sunset, I always went out, and I looked at the sunset happening, and I prayed, and I said, thank you so much. And I was so focused and full of love. And when the sun got down, and, and I watched twilight come, it was so beautiful. And then I went inside and, uh, and did yoga for about an hour. And, and there, there's always a couple exercises that I do when I finish those exercises. That was when I got out of bed, scanned the horizon for ships, and, and put the dinner on to cook. And as soon as I finished yoga, I went and looked and, and dinner was ready. I got my sprouts, my salt fish, I ate fish every day. And my pasta was ready with my Parmesan cheese. And then I would go back into the pilot house time I would bring out a big art book and look at the history of art or write. And then when that was over, I would clean up and uh, look for ships. And if it was nice enough and I wouldn't get wet from the spray, I would go outside and lay and look at the stars and look all around. And then I would have my uh, four or five cups of tea every night. And then I would go right to sleep. And then I'd wake up 45 minutes, an hour later, scan around again, go back to sleep. And before I went back to sleep, I had my jug of water in a certain place. I would a whole bunch of water, then I wake up 45 minutes or an hour later, go to the bathroom, praying and saying thank you all the time. And and then dawn was coming and then the day began again. I have a question. You, the impression is that what you wanted eventually was to be able to come back and give to humanity something of what you were learning. And uh, it seems to me that your message to people is not everybody here in the world has to go out for a thousand days on a ship. So what are you saying now as a spiritual messenger to everyone else as to what is it that you are teaching to all of us at this point? Uh, um, I titled the voyage, The Mars Ocean Odyssey, 
1,000 days nonstop at sea. I, after I decided I was no longer going to go 1,000 days, I was going to go further. And after I realized maybe hardly anyone is interested in the Mars voyage, but I was getting a lot of love. So I said, you know, I'm changing it to the love voyage because what I love doing and, and is being here and, uh, and the love is what sustains me. So a lot of my, my message is family love. And, and if you give love under every circumstance in your life, then um, you, you can help the world and help yourself the most and that it, whatever dream that you have, if you're inspired to do it, um, through the power of love and, and by tuning in to our uh, greater powers, that people can help the world and help themselves. This is something everyone can do. So that's sort of my message. You said when you were deep into your meditation that you saw you past generations and future generations. And it was all together. Yes. What did the future generation look like? Was it clear or was it? Uh, well, it's a lot like it is now. And it's a lot like it was. And it's sort of eternal. And um, that uh, is sort of like realizing the omnipotence of God. It's sort of like seeing everything at one time. And the past and the future and the present merge into one. And that the universe exists in a drop of dew. And that experience of connecting with the past and the future is in that drop of dew. And every little atom contains everything that ever is and was and will be. That's sort of a feeling that I get. And it's a big vision and it's a grand vision. And that's the feeling that I have when I describe that sort of thing. What's your opinion or thoughts on the winter equinox of 2012? Uh, I don't know about that. I'm not sure. Well, they made movies about it, the Mayan calendar, everyone's they've written books, everyone's talking about the paradigm shift. I believe it's when the shaman will emerge and we'll all be enlightened and connected and know the indigenous perspective that we're all one with Earth and God, and God is in everything. All of that sounds great, but... I've but they're making really Hollywood young. movies of end-of-the-world scenarios and stuff about 2012. Oh, I, I, I don't really know about that. I never really understood uh, prophecies and stuff like that. I kind of always understood what I experience. When I talk about experiencing the past, present, and future in, in, a, in, a, in the light, in a, in a drop of a wave that's hanging in a certain place on the boat, that's sort of something that I experience. And in, within that, I get a vision of oneness and a vision of omnipotence and totality. But I never understood uh, uh, prophecies and stuff like that. I, 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 one most mystical experience of my life was going to a phosphorescent bay in, in the A case, and also years ago in Puerto Rico, swimming in the water with the light. And I understand that phosphorescent moons happen at sea. Do you encounter any? Do you I had any incredible phosphorescent experiences. All kinds of incredible phosphorescent experiences where it was so brilliant that I could hardly believe it and I could hardly go to sleep. I was looking at some things that were so amazing. All those stories are on my website. <laughs> and if I take a photo of it, I made a painting to describe it. Well, I have to conserve my voice. Yes. One more. One more. One more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what kind of dreams did you have? What kind well, of dreams? And what did the birds speak to you? Did the waves speak to you? Did oh. the clouds speak to you? Yes. They, they, I had more experiences with the birds and the waves speaking to me. As every wave passed, I felt it was my duty to take care of every wave until it reached the shore. <laughs> and so I was having those kind of experiences very much so. Uh, as for dreams, I, I can't say that I've really accessed the uh, great wonder of dreams that I've heard people talk about. I had all kinds of dreams at sea, but nothing that I could say. It, the dreams are not one of my greatest tools for experiencing and doing what I do. I'm not that familiar with that. I had all kinds of dreams, everyone in my life appeared to me, and all kinds of things happened. But it, but it wasn't something that I could say was, was a magical thing. 
that I was able to use to access greater things. Thank you, Harold. Yeah, no, thank me. Thank me. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.